The reason we all gathered here today is just a, a follow-up to the uh, AOP Summit that Rich uh, Kern organized this spring. And uh, there's a lot of interest uh, in that, do a follow-up field session to go around and see some actual projects that completed so everybody can learn from things that people are doing in the field. I've been working uh, with towns, especially uh, after Tropical Storm Irene, and trying to have towns become more flood resilient and being ready for the next flood event. This is especially important in the areas of transportation infrastructure and stream crossings and maintenance of gravel road and gravel road drainage ditches and in, in, in preparing for river road conflicts and anticipating those. We found that if we properly size stream crossings uh, to at least our bank full width uh, or better, and if they're installed correctly and take into account aquatic organism passage, not only will they be, be able to better withstand the next flood and reduce maintenance costs for towns, but um, also uh, allow for aquatic organism passage and stream stability. We often see a lot of erosion upstream and downstream of culverts that are in, improperly sized or, or installed and a lot of uh, downstream scour, for example. Some grant programs that we work with include the VTrans Structures Grant for stream crossing replacements as well as the Better Back Roads program for improving gravel road drainage, river road conflicts, uh, in some cases river road embankment protection, um, and improving drainage culverts and upgrading structures. Uh, there's also many other federal programs like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and also uh, the forest, U.S. Forest Service in different parts of the state that are uh, applicable. Uh, the Forest Service has been working on connecting aquatic habitats or doing aquatic organism passage for many years across the country. Uh, we got into it in Green Mountain National Forest um, probably 10 years or so ago and we were doing some small projects trying to retrofit culverts and allow fish to move up through them. Uh, we got into it a little more seriously uh, after we learned about the Forest Service's stream simulation design uh, methodology. And basically it's a way to design stream crossings so that they're invisible to aquatic organisms. The stream through the culvert is no more difficult for a fish or an aquatic or organism to move through than the regular stream is. When I talk with folks in my town about these stream crossing structures, I no longer focus just on aquatic, aquatic organism passage and the need for brook trout to get up into our headwater streams. I talk about flood resiliency. I talk about how when the next big one comes, uh, we could be better prepared and we could be less disrupted and less impacted if we invest a little bit more money into structures that are more likely to survive floods. It's no guarantee. Uh, and it'll, it'll protect people's investments. It'll protect um, our roads. Um, it could save lives, could save homes. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an investment. Costs a little bit more money um, up front, uh, but the life, um, the life of these structures is longer than the traditional smaller structures that we've used in the past that um, were designed for a 25 or a 35 year flow event. They're designed to, to reach their capacity to fail at floods above those, those flood flows. Um, the new structures that we're talking about they're going to pass fish, but they're also going to pass a hundred year flood and more. On one particular structure on Jenny Coolidge Brook down in the Manchester district, it passed the flood flows that were estimated to be about 500 year flood event. Uh, and at the downstream end of the structure, there was a, a woody debris jam of material that moved through that culvert and ended up jamming up downstream of the culvert. The previous structure would have been blocked by that debris and it would have failed during our read. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look different in our town um, when the next big one comes and we've got um, all these structures that, that have the potential to survive these flood flows. When you ask somebody about how does a structure perform if it's an engineer, he wants to look at it from a water standpoint. If you look at it from a biological standpoint, it's whether or not critters are going upstream and downstream in it. And we're trying to look at it from a holistic approach. By making these bigger, we're also making them more flood resilient. Prior to Tropical Storm Irene, behind me there was a 10-foot diameter culvert. 
That culvert was barely big enough to pass the water during normal periods of time. But it was small enough where you couldn't get fish passage through it as well. During high flows like Tropical Storm Irene, that structure became a dam. When that washed out, there was a lot of damage downstream. I have no idea how much that cost, but it's definitely more than the cost of putting in a structure big enough to be more flood resilient in the future. The thing about these, their installation is really quick. We can shut a road down and in many cases and do these projects in less than a week's time without a temporary detour, particularly if it's in a local road setting. And that'll save a lot of money and you can usually do two to three bridges for the cost of what we were doing one years back. VTrans does a lot of these projects around the state and we work with the towns a lot of times through the town highway grant program and uh, these are uh, opportunities to make your infrastructure in your towns more flood resilient while ecologically better as well. And there's a value to the ecology of an area that you can't really put your hands on, but it does add value to the overall area. So when you get to a project, you have to make some decisions. A lot of times cost is a big factor. Now, I always use the analogy about fixing a roof. You can put a blue tarp on your roof and get by for a short period of time, but in the long haul, it's probably not gonna do the trick. Conversely, you're probably not gonna go with a copper roof because that's gonna be too cost prohibitive. So for most of us, we have to find some place in the happy medium. So we're gonna either go shingles or a galvanized roof. The structure behind me is pretty much that middle of the road. It's not really a bridge, it's not really a culvert. It's a large structure that kind of takes the place of both. It gives a holistic approach for all. You know, everybody always focuses on the bad that came out of Tropical Storm Irene, and there was, certainly was an awful lot of bad. But the good thing out of Tropical Storm Irene is what we have behind us today. We're now building infrastructure that's better and more resilient for the future. It's ecologically better for the immediate day in hand. Prior to Irene, we only had a handful of these types of structures in the state, but when Irene hit, those structures that were in the ground took a licking and kept ticking. That was a great sales pitch and that's why we're able to do so many today. This was uh, culvert replacement uh, in September of 2012. Um, I oversaw the uh, construction of this uh, implementation. Um, also helped with uh, uh, bring all the funding partners together. FEMA was coming in after Irene replacing structures with the towns, replacing in kind or bringing them up to the adopted coded standard. The adopted coded standard for this would have been a five foot culvert. So we added uh, more funds to that to improve it. The total cost on this project was 70,000. Uh, of that, I think FEMA paid 22, Forest Service paid around 48. So we're replacing uh, as many culverts as we could that failed in Irene with, by adding uh, Forest, Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife funds uh, to it. You know, sure, we could have put a, a, a box in here. We could have done, you know, something pretty expensive. But we wanted to see what we could do um, that didn't cost an arm and a leg. You know, this one was 70000 The next one we did was um, 49000 And then the one we just finished was fifty five. Um, and so the towns are seeing that, and they're like, wow, it's not like a $200,000 project. This is doable. Uh, size on this culvert was uh, two 30-inch pipes. They were uh, side by side originally. Um, about 15 feet of fill on the, at the outlet. And so in Irene, it acted like a dam. I held back all that water, and then when it went, you had that surge. Took out a culvert down here, a, a 15 foot bottomless arch, buckled, flooded the house adjacent to it, bypassed the bridge down below, and destroyed a house further downstream. Um, and so, pretty high up in the watershed, but from a flood resiliency standpoint, um, a uh, pretty, pretty key uh, culvert. You know, the AOP wasn't how I sold it. It was all about flood resiliency. And, and coming in right after Irene, you know, the easy thing for the town to have done was just to put the five foot culvert in here and take FEMA's money and be done with it. Um, and and I, 
I think we were very lucky to have a town willing to let us uh, add money um, and patient enough to allow us to go through that process, uh, which wasn't speedy. Um, but the good thing out of that is once we started putting these in, the town started adding culverts, saying, what about these? What about these? You can get, you can do whatever ones you want. You can, you know, work with us. And we're trying to figure out a way so that we're not paying the whole bill. So if the town is, is going to, is going to uh, replace a culvert, um, helping them prioritize so it's not only just fixing a culvert that, that, it, that needs to be fixed from a, from a structural standpoint, but also one that's also benefiting AOP as well. Um, that's the number one thing that I hammer on when I deal with the pounds is this is going to reduce your maintenance costs incredibly. And then you start getting people on board and then you start bringing in the fish and the sediment transport regime to describe why the maintenance costs are better as well as improving recreational uh, opportunities if you are in a, a larger watershed area. And we never had maintenance records on all these structures, but anecdotally, we had guys saying, oh yeah, I went back to this structure three times in the 90s, two times in the 2010s, but nobody kept good track record. But they knew, yeah, we had two, three trucks running there, three guys out there, plus 10 meetings to do it yep. every five years. So there's cost associated with it. Yeah. And, and even those costs aren't always recognized because once a town has a, a three-person road crew, we were just talking about this at the last stop, they don't recognize that that three-person that three -person road crew is a fixed cost. It's there, they're every day. So if they're going to snag a culvert from downstream and dump, you know, put some more gravel on it, that's just, well, they could be doing something else. There could right. be other efficiencies that, that they, they could be meeting as well as not that however many dump trucks loads of gravel now introduced to the system and are headed downstream. If you have those funds, it's always easier to leverage those funds to get more funding. If you've got one lined up, start working on your next one because it's going to be easier to fund that next one if you can link the two together, but also if you have the, the initial funding. You know, for, for towns, communities that are interested in working on, on this type of thing, there are resources out there for them. Uh, if you're not a national forest town, um, you can look for your local watershed group. You can look for a conservation group like Trout Unlimited or the Nature Conservancy. Um, you can um, contact the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service who has a program for aquatic organism passage. So there are partners, there's folks out there that want to help with this. Um, we know it's a, a challenge to these small communities to uh, replace old structures with what seem like expensive and costly um, uh, flood resilient structures. But there, there are resources out there for you and most of these projects are done in some form of partnership. Um, they're expensive and the more partners we can bring to them, the more resources, the better off we'll all be and the more we'll be able to accomplish. Mm -hmm.